In episode two, the first thing that Sugar does in the morning is meet with Bernie Siegel, Olivia's father, but also John Siegel's son. Bernie's also a movie producer, but he's not nearly as successful as his dad. In fact, most of his movies are trash. The issue for Sugar isn't his movies, it's how cavalier he is with the fact that Olivia's missing. It seems like he doesn't really care. He doesn't think it's a big deal, because Olivia's done this before. He figures that she'll just turn up eventually, like she always has. Sugar finds it weird that Olivia's grandfather is more concerned with the fact she's missing than her actual father. He finds it fishy. Bernie, though, tries to pull a fast one on Sugar by saying, I know Olivia better than anyone, better than my father, and certainly better than Melanie, my ex-wife. I bet you didn't know that. Because Bernie was the one who was actually having Sugar tailed. It wasn't Davy. But this whole pulling a fast one on Sugar doesn't work because Sugar is well aware of Bernie and Melanie's relationship. He knows all about it. The fact that they eloped, the fact that they got arrested during their honeymoon, the whole nine yards. In fact, it's actually Sugar who's the one who pulls a fast one on Bernie by surprising him with the photos of his wife that he lost, Olivia's mother. Because of the particular film and when it was released, Sugar knows that Bernie and Rachel, Olivia's mom, were married. And Bernie admits, yes, we were, but I didn't take those photos. And Sugar knows that he's being honest. But Bernie gets a little defensive, curses Sugar out, saying, if you think I don't care about my daughter, then screw you, and walks off. Although that's kind of a tell to Sugar that he's on the right track to something. When Sugar gets home later that day, he decides to check his surveillance video, and he's not surprised that he had visitors when he was away. It was Davey and Kenny. They were snooping. They set up a couple of bugs so they could eavesdrop on Sugar. And he watches as they take some pictures of his mail, one of them being that invitation that he got the previous day. But after turning off the listening devices, he calls his, quote, mother. He tells the person on the other line, hey, someone is going to contact you. They want to talk to my mom. Obviously, they think that's you. I'm sure they're on their way. And then he hangs up. As for Bernie, after he was done with Sugar, he headed to the set. He's very stressed out because Davey's new movie is supposed to come out. And it's supposed to be his coming out party again, reintroducing him to the world as David, not Davey, but also putting him in a big spotlight for award season. This movie's supposed to be big. And also, Bernie needs it to be big. His production company needs it to be big. The problem is, David has eight lawsuits against him. And they've been able to settle with seven of the girls, but there's one who's holding out. Now, Bernie doesn't seem all that concerned with it. He's confident that she'll either keep her mouth shut or they'll be able to settle. But if these lawsuits do come out, then the movie never comes out. And David's coming out party is canceled. And that's bad news for Bernie Siegel. Later in the day, he heads home. He meets up with David and Kenny. They show Bernie what they found in Sugar's apartment. And unfortunately, it's not all that much. And they haven't been able to get any information because it's pretty clear he found the bug. This stresses Bernie even more, so he tells Davey, I want to report on who this John Sugar is by tomorrow evening. I can't have some foreign body messing with my ecosystem. Sugar, meanwhile, did his job. He spent the rest of the day trying to find Olivia. He interviewed a bunch of her friends, and what he was able to find is that she was indeed on the right track. She stopped buying drugs. She stopped hanging out with bad crowds. And as for the dead guy in Olivia's trunk, his name's Clifford Carter. He's been arrested for assault, rape, you name it, he's a bad dude. But none of Olivia's friends ever remember seeing him with her. There might be, though, an interesting clue on Olivia's GPS system. Olivia went to the house of a woman who was murdered. Her name was Carmen Vasquez, and she was raped and murdered, and Olivia just happened to be at that place the night that it happened. Or at least her car was there the night that Carmen was killed. And Sugar's pretty confident that Clifford, the dead guy in the trunk, had something to do with it. It's all connected some way. He just can't quite piece it together. He heads to give Jonathan Siegel an update on the case. And he starts out by discussing his conversation earlier in the day with Bernie. Jonathan's not surprised at Bernie's reaction. Doesn't really seem like the two are all that close. But Jonathan does get concerned when Sugar presents the information he found regarding Clifford and Carmen. The murder, the body, all of it. He's worried that his granddaughter's in danger, but he's also worried about the fact that his granddaughter's car has a dead body in it currently. Now, he's supposed to report this to the police, but he tells Jonathan he's going to be discreet, and Jonathan really appreciates that. 
After visiting with Jonathan, he heads to Ruby's house to fill her in on everything he's discovered about the case. And he's troubled because he just can't quite put the pieces together. But he feels like they're connected. As he's leaving Ruby's, though, his hand once again locks up and Ruby gets really concerned. She asks him, when are you going to meet with Dr. Vickers? And he says, I'll see him at the meeting tomorrow. I'll schedule an appointment. He once again plays it off like it's no big deal, but Ruby knows that this is a big deal. The health concerns with Sugar are legitimate, even though Sugar acts like they're not. There's one person, though, that he really, really wants to talk to, and it's Melanie Matthews. He knows just where to find her, at an AA meeting. He walks in as Melanie's actually addressing the group. She hasn't been to an AA meeting in years, but she's addressing the group because she kind of had a come-to-Jesus moment regarding the other night. The fact that she brought a weird guy into her house that she didn't know, she wanted to sleep with him, and the fact that instead of taking advantage of her, he actually took care of her. But Melanie never points out that Sugar was that guy, that guy seated in row three, but she really does appreciate it. And afterwards, she's more than willing to talk to Sugar about what happened with Olivia and anything she can do to help. Although... When they go back to Melanie's house to actually talk about the situation, Melanie's pretty cagey. The first thing Sugar does is ask her, why was Olivia here almost every day leading up to her disappearance? I know she was here because of the GPS system. And instead of admitting it or answering the question, Olivia just questions his question. How do you know? How do you know her friend didn't take her car? He pivots. He brings up that her social media profile changed when the two started hanging out with each other. It seemed like she found a purpose in this political activism. And Melanie actually echoes exactly what Bernie said earlier, that there's really nothing to worry about. Olivia's probably just going to come back like she always has. And Sugar knows that Bernie got to Melanie, and Melanie admits it. Yeah, he called me after you two had breakfast. Look, he might have been a terrible husband, but he's always been a good father. Though Sugar knows she's lying because she's got to tell. She touches her hair. Sugar then shows Melanie a picture of Clifford, saying, do you know who this guy is? And it's clear that Melanie does because as soon as she sees the picture, she gets spooked and she asks Sugar to leave. Before he does leave, he calls her on the fact that he knows she's lying. But he assures her, I'm going to find Olivia because that's what I do and I'm very good at my job. And all Melanie does is show him the door. That night, as Sugar is driving around, kind of having a think, he sees Wiley, the homeless guy's dog, just roaming the streets. Sugar was supposed to call that guy, and he kind of forgot, but now with the dog roaming around, it's got him curious as to where the owner is. He decides to call the guy's phone that he gave him, but there's no answer. He looks at the GPS, he puts Wiley in the car, the two head over to a motel, a motel that was bought with Sugar's money. And when Sugar is able to get into the room, he sees that the homeless guy is overdosed on cocaine. But he's not the only guy in the room. There's another guy who's in the bathroom. And when Sugar questions him on what the hell was given to the homeless guy, the drug dealer just says, screw you. And that's when Sugar jacks him up against a mirror. He's ready to beat the crap out of him. Sugar had this homeless guy in the right path until this guy showed up. Now the homeless guy's dead. Sugar wants revenge, but he stops himself. He grabs the phone. He tells the hotel manager, I was never here, And then he and Wiley head off because he can't leave the dog behind. He heads over to Ruby's to see if Ruby will watch Wiley, but Ruby says, no, I can't. I got a cat. It's not going to work. He then brings up the fact that he noticed he was being tailed earlier in the day. He gives Ruby the make and model of the car and asks her if she has any idea who it might be, but she says no. And says, okay, I'll just keep an eye out for it then. But then she asks him, hey, did you take care of the body in the car? And he hasn't yet. So he decides to head over to Olivia's apartment to do that. Right after he leaves, Ruby hops on the phone with somebody and tells that person, hey, he says he's being tailed. I mean, obviously they're watching him. So even though Ruby told Sugar that she doesn't know who was tailing him, she clearly does. And when Sugar does get to Olivia's apartment, he's in for a surprise. He checks the trunk and there's no body. Clearly somebody beat him to it. He doesn't know who it is. He's a little confused. And the only thing remaining is a couple of hairs that Sugar does take just in case he gets a DNA match. That night, Sugar heads home. He starts looking at the clues that he has. And he's trying to make that connection between Clifford and this murder. And he just can't quite do it. But Sugar's right. They are connected. Because even though Carmen's dead, her sister is not. And that night, her sister is greeted in her home by some bad dude named Stallings. 
Stallings is looking for Clifford. He explains to Carmen's sister that Clifford was dating Carmen. Clifford was working for Stallings. Clifford has something on his phone, yet he's not returning any of Stallings' calls. So he wants to know where Clifford is. Now, Carmen's sister says she doesn't know, but Stallings doesn't believe that. Because the last two texts that Clifford sent Stallings had to do with Carmen, and they weren't very kind. And then he sent Stalling a text that said, hey, do you know who this is? And it's a picture of Melanie. And as Stallings is looking at Carmen's sister, he can tell that she knows exactly who Melanie is. And he's good to get to the bottom of exactly what happened with Clifford, and more importantly, where he can find Clifford's phone to get whatever information is on it so that no one else can get it. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel and subscribing to my Patreon. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked. If you left a comment, I don't get back to you. I usually don't check the comments unless they're like a super comment. Also, if you don't see the next video up on the end screen, not to worry. It'll be up in a day or two.